out in Celebration Magazine Live Zoom land and on Facebook. We are on our last and final day of Live Laugh Zoom. I apologize for that. I clicked wrong. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Last day of Live Laugh Zoom. We have our very, very special guest, Amanda, here with us from the Meadows Museum at SMU. And I'm going to tell you more about her in a second. Before we get to that, I would, as always, love to thank our very special, special guest for today. And that is going to be Don East with Bridgemore at Plano. She has graciously donated $150 worth of prizes for today that is very exciting the prizes are only for the people that are in our zoom so i'm sorry my friends out in facebook you must go to our website celebrationmagazine.com to register to join our zoom events in the future to be eligible for those donise are you ready i am ready first of all i want to say thank you thank you thank you to the amazing celebration magazine team i heard a, a shout out earlier but i as as an advertiser cannot be more grateful and thankful for the incredible uh things that they do it's just amazing and i'm so grateful to be a part of it I'm, welcome everybody i've put my information in the chat for you, we are a brand new uh, 55 plus luxury senior active community in the east part of Plano on 31 acres, as you can see behind me. And uh, I've got all my info in there. Please go to our website and check it out. We are opening in August, but we are taking reservation hold right now. And so uh, enjoy your uh, gift cards, those of you who win, but those of you who don't win today, just know that we at the Bridgemore love you and can't wait to meet you in person one day. But until we meet in person, I just want you to know that we love you and we care about you and we want you to be safe. And my name is Dawn East. I'm the community director and I'm really excited about having the opportunity to open this incredible property with single story cottages as well as a three story tower and walk park and all the most incredible things you can ever imagine. Indoor heated salt water pool. You name it. We got it. If we don't got it, we'll get it. I'm just saying. That's what my owner says. So if he says it, I believe it. We our motto is that we're built by seniors. We are run by seniors for seniors. So I hope to see you out at the Bridgemore as soon as we can open. We're going to schedule sneak a peek tours. Be my friend on Facebook, please, 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 please. I am going to uh, do uh, updates on Facebook. We have a tour of me going through the clubhouse while it's being built. So I found out today I have windows in my office. That's the deal. Windows in my office. So <laughs> I appreciate y'all, appreciate Celebration, appreciate the Meadows Museum. Thank you so much for being a part of this. And uh, we are excited and don't want to delay any more uh, what we have to see today because it's going to be awesome. Enjoy it. Bless y'all. Stay safe and come to see me. All right, Donnie. Well, thank you very, very much. I did want to say she forgot to tell you they've got underground parking, which is really oh. great. Yes. And e is it every every apartment and every cottage comes with a ring doorbell, right? Correct. That is right. We decided it actually the rent includes internet, cable, and the camera doorbell. So yes, all of our rents include that. And uh, they just pay water and electric above that, and they're very nominal on that part because we were sub-metered, water-metered. So it's going to be an incredible place. In fact, I've got I've got an aerial shot. Can you see that? Oh my goodness! Look at that! Look at that! Would you look at that? Would you look at that? Would you look at that? Oops. Look at that! Would you look at that? <laughs> this is our West End. Oh, look at that! Yay! I can do slides, but there you go. Awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Donnie, thank you so much once again for joining us. We will share a slide um, with a beautiful picture of the cottages um, at the end of the presentation, along with their contact information. Um, they are currently um, scheduling private 
sneak a peek tours. So feel free to reach out to Donnie's if you are interested in checking out the community. All right, that said, thank you very much, Donnie's. We are now, it is time for our very special presentation today from the Meadows Museum. We have Amanda W. Dotseth um, with us, and she completed her PhD in Medieval Art and Architecture at the Courtauld Institute of Art, and has had fellowships from the Fulbright Association, the Mellon Foundation, and the Spanish National Research Council. Currently, she's an associated, an associated scholar in, in the project, the Medieval Iberian Treasury in Context, collections, connections, and representations on the peninsula and beyond, and a short-term collaborator on the ERC-funded project Petrifying Wealth, the Southern European Shift to Masonry as Collective Investment in Identity, circa 1050 to 1300. She has contributed to a number of exhibitions at the Meadows Museum, including Fernando Gallego and his workshop, The Altarpiece from Cuidad Rodrigo, Zerbaran, Jacob and his 12 sons, and El Greco, Goya, and A Taste for Spain. Highlights from the Bose Museum. Upcoming projects include canvas and silk, historic fashion from Madrid's Museo del Traje, the art of medieval pilgrimage in Spain, and an edited volume published by Breffels called Collective Display, Medieval Art Out of Isolation, which is forthcoming in 2021. Now that was a tongue twister if I ever had to get through one. So everyone, please give a warm welcome to Amanda Dotseth. Take it away, Amanda. Amanda. Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be here, and I am delighted to see so many of you, um, especially in this in this um, strange time where we're not seeing as many people as we would like to, and especially um, not seeing as many uh, doing as many group events in the museum. So I'm delighted to be here. I will go ahead and share my screen, and let's see. What I wanted, just to give you some sort of beginning ideas, what I wanted to do today was kind of do a, a virtual tour of the Meadows Museum. And I should say that we are open to the public um, with limited capacity. And so the purpose of this was to kind of whet your appetites, give you a little taster of what um, what we do at the museum and some of the important pieces in our collection. But with the idea, I hope that you will all consider visiting one of these days. And we can talk a little bit more about how you would do that at the end of the presentation. And of course, we'll have time for questions as well. I also want to preface this by saying that we, with, um, with the onset of the pandemic, we, and by we, I mean primarily our wonderful education department here at the Meadows, has really pivoted to putting a lot of our content online. So if there's any object I talk about today or anything you want to know more about, I encourage you to go to our website, just Google Meadows Museum SMU, or follow us on Facebook as there's a lot more content. So if I'm just going to give you a little taster today, but if you want to know more, um, I encourage you to seek out that information. There's a wonderful program called Tiny Tours, which is Meadows Museum docents taking deep dives into a lot of the artworks you'll see today. So I encourage you to look at those. So first, I just want to introduce the Meadows Museum. If you don't know the museum, it's part of Southern Methodist University. And by part of Southern Methodist University, I mean we're actually part of the Meadows School of the Art. So we're not a museum like a lot of other museums, like the Dallas Museum of Art, which represents the whole city, but rather we are like a department as in the university. So one of our major missions is not to to just serve you, the kind of general public, and the public of Dallas, but also the students at SMU. And this is our beautiful building, um, and I'll talk about the sculpture out front in a minute, that you can actually see, it's right on Bishop Boulevard, so if you're driving down Mockingbird past SMU, you can see us. We were founded by Alger Hurdle Meadows in the mid-60s, so in 1965. Meadows made most of his fortune in oil. 
And he had an exclusive contract with the Spanish government in the 60s to look for oil in Spain. This meant that he spent long periods of time in Spain and particularly in its capital, Madrid, with his wife, Virginia Meadows. In this process, because they were there for months at, the, at a time, they fell in love with Spanish art and they decided to start buying Spanish art for their home in Dallas. So, unfortunately, after that, uh, Virginia Meadows, who you see on the left, passed away. And in that moment, Alger Meadows decided to donate their collection of Spanish art to Southern Methodist University. And we still, at the, at the museum, honor this legacy and this focus on Spanish art specifically. So I just threw up our mission statement because we're very proud of it. We just rewrote it. <laughs> and to give you a sense of what we do here. So we're about Spanish art, but we're also about Spanish culture. So we do a lot of wonderful kind of programs um, about Spanish culture, one of which um, is available online now as well. It's called Culture Corner and involves a lot of kind of fun, um, recipes and things like that about Spanish culture as well. And it's done by our events manager, Robin Benson Linick. So I encourage you to check that out as well. The original museum in 1965 was actually in the Meadows School of the Arts. And you see an image of that here. But in, 2000, in 2001, we opened a brand new building, the one that we're in now. And this is the one I encourage you all to come and visit. One of the exhibitions we're doing in spring of next year is actually celebrating the 20th anniversary of the building and particularly of its sculpture garden, which I will talk about in a minute, but I hope you can see in this image and I hope you can see my um, mouse going around. These are all outdoor sculptures and modern sculpture. So this is a really great activity if you're just looking for, you wanna take in some art, but maybe you don't wanna to have to go into a building and all of that. The sculpture garden is always open. So you can come by any time and, and enjoy the collection. To start things off, the first thing that greets you when you come down Bishop Boulevard is this wonderful sculpture, which is called The Wave by Santiago Calatrava. The Meadows Museum commissioned it when we built the new building. And you can't see it here because it's just static, but if you come in person when the museum's open to the public, the sculpture actually moves, it waves. It's a really remarkable piece of art. It's quite big, as you can tell, and it consists of 129 bronze-coated steel bars, and so they move independently to create this kind of wave motion. So you can enjoy art without even getting out of your car. I encourage you to kind of drive down Bishop Boulevard and just sit and, and enjoy the sculpture and look at it. Some of you may know Santiago Calatrava if you have been to Dallas or live in Dallas because we're lucky enough to have two bridges by this wonderful um, Spanish artist. He's from the southern town of Valencia, which is a wonderful port city in Spain. So you see a lot of these visual references to sails and sailing. And so if you know these two wonderful bridges and you want to see some of his actually um, artistic production, come see The Wave, which is one of the first monumental sculptures by the artist in the U.S. And speaking of sculpture, after Virginia Meadows passed away, Alger Meadows remarried this wonderful woman who you see on the left called Elizabeth, Elizabeth Meadows. She was less interested in Spanish art than she was, and you can tell this by her, her portrait. She was interested in modern sculpture. And so one key component of our collection, which is not focused exclusively on Spain, are these wonderful sculptures you see in the sculpture garden there. And there's excellent examples by Henry Moore, who you may have heard of, and Claes Oldenburg, for example. So again, I do encourage you, even if you don't come inside, although I hope you will, um, please come and enjoy the sculpture garden. One of the key pieces in said sculpture garden is this wonderful piece by an artist from Barcelona called Jaume Puenza. Anyone who's been to the Art Institute of Chicago and seen the wonderful fountain there with these faces that kind of spit water um, will know this artist. He's, he's really a remarkable creator. In this case, we have this wonderful sculpture of a little girl that he knew. She worked, um, she was the daughter of the owners of a Chinese, Chinese restaurant near his house in Barcelona. 
And so he made this amazing sculpture of her. And I hope you can tell from the building on the left how absolutely monumental it is. And as you walk around it, it sort of changes. So even though it's this very heavy, large sculpture, it weighs over 600 pounds, it has this kind of sense of lightness. And it changes every time you see it. It changes in different light. It's this kind of wonderful metal mesh um, that gives volume to the shape. So again, a wonderful thing to visit even if you don't step foot in the door. When you do step foot in the door, however, I am happy to say there is even more wonderful things that await you. And I'm focusing on sculpture here. So this is if, if you come up the stairs, although of course we have an elevator, if you come up the stairs, this is the scene that greets you. You'll pass a wonderful painting on the landing, which I'm not showing you here, but you'll also arrive and see another piece of wonderful modern sculpture. Again, one of these things that Elizabeth Meadows, Meadows' second wife, contributed to the museum. And this beautiful sculpture is by the French sculptor Maillot, and he's pulling on these wonderful kind of classic references to the Three Graces. Um, to depict this. It's the same model that he depicted three times. And I hope you get a sense, maybe you can see there's a security guard with a mask right here in the background. And so you get a sense that these figures are almost life-size. One of the interesting things about this sculpture as well is we know Mayol, we know the artist, it, this was one of his favorites. He actually initially installed this in his own garden. It's made of lead. So you can imagine it's extremely heavy, but also quite soft. So um, it's a really remarkable piece. He didn't make, he, he preferred lead because he liked the color. Bronze could be very dark and he preferred lead. But most of the sculptures that survived by Mayol are actually in bronze. Bronze is of course much more durable. Anyone who's ever worked with lead knows how soft it is. So this is a very <laughs> precious um, but huge thing that we have in our building. Just off this wonderful space where you have this French sculpture, you can, and we go back in time. So most visitors, if they come up the stairs, they start in this beautiful gallery. And this gallery represents a mix of loans from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, such as this huge altarpiece in the back, which is dedicated to St. Peter, one of Christ's apostles. And again, this little altarpiece on the side. This is part of a long-term loan from Boston. We've had the works for over 10 years, and I hope they continue to stay here. As you can see, they really pack a punch. But in this case, we're starting in the chronological earliest days of our collection in the late Middle Ages. So most of what you see in this image is from the 15th century. And so we're talking about the time in Spain when the king and queen known as the Catholic monarchs, so Isabella and Ferdinand, were in power. This is right around the time that, of course, Columbus sails to the Americas and, quote, discovers <laughs> the. Um, the people there and so right around this time period. As you can see most of the art in this room is was produced for a religious context. So most of what you see here would have originally been in a church, in a Christian church and, and specifically in a Catholic church of course in Spain. So just to focus on one or two objects in each gallery, that's the idea. So again, taster, not deep dive, kind of like tapas, right? So what we have here is a recent acquisition that we made by an artist called the Master of Sijena. However, he's been recently identified, now we actually know his name, it's Rodrigo of Sajonia. And this picture is of the Three Kings. Anyone who um, knows the the New Testament of the Christian Bible might have already recognized this, but you have three, the three magi or the three kings here, and they're visiting just after the birth of Jesus, they're visiting him. One of the things I love about this painting though is actually how bright and colorful it is. It really attracts your eye. There's wonderful details here like this leather, it's like a leather handbag. It looks like it's embroidered. Again, come and see it in person. I strongly encourage you to. And this, this um, Magus's uh, robe 
is actually made with gold leaf. So if you come in and you see the, the work up close, you can get close and see that in this case, it's not painted that color to look like gold, it's actual gold. So these were wonderful luxury objects and they would have glinted in the candlelight of the church and been participant in all the wonderful trappings of the mass and of religious ritual. This painting was made in, in the early 16th century. So this is a time when Spain was very powerful. We're in the period just after the discovery of the Americas. The Netherlands were also part of Spain. So this is kind of an apogee of Spain's empire with so much wealth coming out of the Americas. And we'll talk more about that later. Things like gold, precious stones, precious materials, silver, of course, excavated by, by um, native peoples in most cases who were enslaved. So it, it's, a, it's a complicated, difficult story, but it's one that is really important to think about, I, I think, our own origins and what Spain's doing with this great imperial power. Later on, we'll get, <laughs> we'll get to the part where it starts declining, but right here we're at the, 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 um, the, the tip of the iceberg, as it were. So, just to give you another example of sculpture, this is a, a later piece. So I hope you can see between the work we were looking at before and this one, how we've shifted to, in a century, a much more naturalistic impression. This looks like, and I should say this is a nearly life-size sculpture. It's painted terracotta, so polychrome ter terracotta. And I hope you agree, it looks so real. It's kind of visceral. You can see the figure's flesh. And this is part of a tradition in the, in the um, late 17th, early 18th century, where the naturalism of an artwork was really meant to grab the audience. This is, you're meant to have an emotional reaction to this piece. And so again, I hope you come see it in person. It's really attractive in the kind of literal sense of the word. It attracts you. Um, and this is St. Paul, as you can see, St. Paul the Hermit, so who is believed to be one of the first hermits. So not the Apostle Paul, Hermit Paul. This is a, um, this is a, a figure from the third century, so early, early years of Christianity or early centuries of Christianity, who followed a philosophy that depriving yourself of worldly pleasures um, and removing yourself from society and going out into the desert was the way to achieve true spirituality. And so he reputedly went and lived in a cave, ate next to nothing, and miraculously lived to be like 130 or something like that because he was receiving spiritual sustenance rather than literal physical sustenance. And so these are all the ideas that you were encouraged to contemplate when you saw this work. And, and think about how you could reflect that in your own life. Moving forward, and I'm including some gallery shots that this is how the installation is now. If you wait too terribly long to come to the meadows, it might look a little different. But I wanted to give you a sense of where things were in the building. So that's the kind of tour part of this. In this gallery, we've, we're, we have a mix of mostly 16th um, and early 17th century works. And I wanted to focus on this one in particular. Um, this is the one painting in the collection by the artist known as El Greco. El Greco was called El Greco, it just literally means the Greek, because he was from Crete. And then he studied in, um, in Italy, and then he eventually settled in Toledo in Spain. Toledo is just south of Madrid, and it's a very old, very important city in Spanish history. He made his money, and he was very popular precisely because of images like this. As you see, it's not too terribly big, um, and he produced many of these, and in fact, he produced, I think, just under 10 versions of this very image. This is Saint Francis, who is a saint from the 13th century, who followed, in some way, he followed in the line of St. Paul the Hermit in the sense that it, he was, as you see, he's in this kind of cave setting, he's contemplating a crucifix, there's that skull there as well, so you're, compliment, or you're contemplating the fragility of human life and the goal being that you're ra raised to a higher spiritual 
state. The Franc he founded an order called the Franciscans, and any of you who've traveled around the southwestern US, or maybe you've been to San Antonio, you've seen those missions from many from the 17th or 18th century that were founded by Franciscan monks. So these were a group of people who one of their goals was conversion and to convert the native peoples of the Americas to Christianity. And this was the person who founded that order. I put a detail here on the right just because I'd, I hope you can appreciate, and again, come see it in person, please. I hope you can appreciate this wonderful painting and this wonderful brushwork. One of the miracles of St. Francis was that he received the stigmata. So he actually received the wounds that Christ received in the, in the crucifixion. And you can see how delicately here he's painted. It's just a quick little smudge of red to indicate that Francis has received this, this miracle and received the stigmata on his hand. I feel like El Greco in the history of art is seen as very ahead of his time and very modern. And I hope this detail, which maybe looks more to you like an impressionist painting, like Monet or someone like, or Renoir. So you can see he, he is, I mean, we're talking about this, this 1605 to 10 here. He's really in the way he's painting light and shadow and using this quick brushwork, he really what is ahead of his time. Moving into the next gallery, and again, we're going roughly chronologically here. This is the, in some ways, the jewels of our crown. These are three paintings by Velázquez. Velázquez was the court painter of King Philip IV. And by now we're in the mid 17th century, Spain's empire is on its way out. They've lost much of the Netherlands. We've had a little thing called the Protestant Reformation happen. Um, so Catholicism itself is to some extent under, under threat. Um, and we have a ruling family who's been in place for quite some time since, really since um, Isabella and Ferdinand um, we're in power at the end of the 15th century. So we're, we're, we fast forwarded a few hundred years. Um, and Belafquez was known, wasn't that well known outside of Spain. He was, he mainly worked in the court, painted portraits and painted some religious scenes as well. He was really sort of rediscovered in the 19th century, again, by the Impressionists. Manet, for example, was a huge fan of Velázquez. And I hope the detail on the right explains why. Again, this is a detail and it's so quick and it looks like an Impressionist painting. If I just showed you that detail, you'd probably think it was a modern abstract piece, right? Instead, however, it's a detail from this wonderful portrait of Mariana of Austria. She um, has a little bit of an interesting story. The Habsburgs were notorious for intermarrying within their family. This was seen as a way to keep the bloodline pure. Mariana was initially betrothed to, to Philip IV's son. Unfortunately, he passed away. So, and there was still no male heir. And so she ended up marrying her uncle. Philip IV. She was only 14 when she married him. By the time this portrait was painted, she'd been the Queen of Spain, married to her uncle, for some almost a decade. And this is the kind of painting that Velázquez probably would have made from life. So you can imagine Mariana actually sitting for Velázquez in the studio. And that's why the face is so beautifully detailed and so accurate. But this area down here, you can see, looks like it's completely unfinished. So this is an, a way that Velázquez could have worked from life, got a good likeness of the queen, and then he could have used that face elsewhere in other portraits, bigger portraits that were, say, life-size. Um, Belafkas also, curiously enough, designed this crazy wig she's wearing. I don't even want to know how heavy this thing was, but you can see how elaborate it is. Look at these feathers coming off the top and these little itty bitty dots that he painted with just a flick of the brush. Those were actually pearls. So she had pearls hanging from this, from this wig as well. These are all, of course, wonderful symbols of her power and her status. She, um, after, her, after Philip IV passed away, their son was really quite young. So she actually was a queen regent. She ruled in her own right for nearly three decades because her son was quite sickly. Again, from, we think at least, from the inbreeding. 
Um, but I love this idea of this woman who was in this very difficult position as a 14-year-old girl marrying her uncle, but ended up wielding quite a bit of power. This painting I'll just speak about briefly, but it's so beautiful, I couldn't not put it up. Unlike the previous one, we don't know who this, this person is. She's a kind of allegorical figure, even though she may have been based on an actual person. But this is an example, the best example perhaps, of why artists like Manet love Belafka's. Just look at the way this kind of gauzy garment has been painted with such quick, quick brush, bro dress, brush strokes. I can't talk. So moving forward, now we have, we're in a bigger gallery and bigger paintings. And in this gallery, I'd like to just show you a couple of works by one of Belafquez's contemporaries. So Belafquez was working in the court in Madrid. Meanwhile, Murillo, also from Seville. So the two artists trained together, but then Murillo stayed in Seville. Seville was such an important city at the time. It was a port city because the river was actually navigatable. So all the ships coming from the New World. So every bar of gold, every bar of silver, every fancy new dye stuff, every exotic feather came through Seville. So the city became extremely wealthy. And as part of that wealth, it meant that its religious institutions were commissioning major works of art. And if you look at the dimensions of this, oops, if you look at the dimensions, you can see just how big it is. It's two by three meters. So we are talking about a huge painting. And even better is that it was one of many. This is part of a series. So we're talking about big spaces, big walls, and big canvases to fill the, to fill the space. It's a religious subject from the Old Testament, which is, which is fairly unusual, but even if you don't know the story, I think you can really appreciate this image as a kind of charming genre scene. There's a little dog here curled up sleeping. It's very sweet, and these kind of peasanty looking people with their, with their um, horse, and then of course Jacob with the flock of sheep. Speaking of Seville, it's, these are two paintings of the patron saints of Seville. And um, they're not only beautifully painted, but these are the kind of paintings, they're just pretty, right? They're beautiful. And these kinds of paintings are what made Murillo extremely popular, not only during his lifetime outside of Spain, but in the 19th century. This is the kind of stuff that British and American eventually collectors started buying in the 19th and 20th century. The Meadows Museum has more works by this artist, by Murillo, than any other museum in the U.S. And so I do encourage you to come look at them. I also put these up because this story of the afterlife of paintings is beautifully represented by these. These two paintings were actually, by the 19th century, in the collection of a relative of the Rothschilds, which is, of course, this wonderful banking this Jewish banking family that was all over France and eventually in London as well. So they were owned by the French Rothschilds. Unfortunately, during the Second World War, these two paintings were looted by the Nazis. We know this because we have photographic evidence and written documentation that they were stolen and then recovered and then returned. So this is a happy ending in a way. There's, of course, tons of art out there that was looted and not returned. And anyone who reads the art press periodically will see that there are these, these frequent instances of families reclaiming things that were stolen from them during the war. This is a happy story for us, certainly, um, in that they were actually returned. And this was thanks to um, the wonderful efforts of people like the Monuments Men and um, the entire allied apparatus for returning looted artifacts. So if anyone seems, has seen that movie, um, Monuments Men, with like George Clooney and all that, these paintings were part of that story. Moving forward, and also in some ways back in time, um, or sorry, forward in time, we are now at the end of the 18th century, um, looking at a work by one of Spain's most famous artist, Francisco de Goya. This is, you may have noticed, the first painting I've showed you that isn't a portrait of an elite person or a religious painting. This is, it's called Yard with Mad Men, but this is something that Goya, and we have letters so we know this, this is something Goya said he actually saw at an insane asylum in Zaragoza. 
which is the city he grew up in. So here we are at the end of the 18th century with an artist who's really pushing the boundaries. This isn't a portrait of a king, although he was court painter. This is a scene not sort of from everyday life. But I think, I hope you agree, and again, it's hard to see in this slide, and the slide, this painting always goes green in reproductions. I hope you can see on the right um, more accurate representation of the color. But just look at the way he's painted these sort of sad, trapped, tortured souls. There's this harsh, harsh light coming in from above. It's pure white. It looks like pure lead white coming in from above, but is completely inaccessible to these poor people below. So there's a kind of social critique element we see in this as well. Goya was known to be a fan of the French Enlightenment and to be an artist who was very forward thinking and saying this kind of thing, this is why Spain is behind, um, treating its people this way. And this painting was part of a series of cabinet pictures, which is just a term to mean small format pictures. They're all on tin, so there's this kind of luminosity. So we're, this is also the first time we're looking at something that's not painted on canvas um, or panel, wood panel. This is on metal. Um, so it has a very kind of different feel in the way the paint lays on the surface. Um, but it's also, again, part of this wonderful series that one is, for example, of people in a, in a prison. So you get this sense that he's pushing this social commentary. Um, again, really inspired by the French Enlightenment, and Goya would pass away in 1828 in voluntary exile in France. It was in France at this time that he painted this painting. This is one of the last paintings that we know Goya painted. And it's so wonderful because, again, it's personal. It's not an, you know, it's not a portrait of a, of a, of a king. This is Goya's grandson. And so I just love it because, and there's even an inscription on the back in Goya's hand that, that's dedicating this painting to his grandson. But I also include this wonderful detail on the right of this, the, as evidence of what Goya is doing with his, with his brush late in his career. And again, another reason why he was an artist who was so respected by the Impressionist painters who would come along later in, in the 19th century. But you just, I just love how quickly he's painted this kind of corvette and where you get this layer, sorry, I'm pointing at the screen, which doesn't help anyone, this layer um, here of black paint that he's brushed over the top with this white um, so that you get this kind of translucency of the black showing through. It's, it's again, just stunning. And, you know, one great advantage of the Meadows is a lot of our paintings are not glazed. Our collections manager would not be happy to hear me saying this, but they're not glazed, so they don't, you're not looking through glass to see these. Um, it's really a great, wonderful way to have an intimate experience with a work of art. So um, moving Sticking to chronology, but going downstairs very quickly, I just wanted to show you this lovely portrait. This is by an artist, um, the artist who trained Goya, so we're a little bit back in time. But I wanted to show you to her because she's, or show her to you, I guess I'm showing you to her as well, um, because she's, she's just one of our most popular paintings, partly because she has this lovely little pug dog with her, and we all colloquially around the museum call her Donut Girl. <laughs> because she's holding this donut. But I wanted to show it to you because these things that seem kind of commonplace to us were actually major symbols of this little girl's wealth. Um, she was from a very important noble family, and even though she's really quite young, notice she's already wearing a corset, right? So she's already being dressed as a woman and and wearing these yards and yards of silk and lace. Everything about this scene and this woman, or this little girl, really conveys her wealth and the role she would ascend to in her family. Shifting to a landscape painting, this is another one of my, my personal favorites in the collection. It's a recent acquisition, um, and this is by an artist that probably isn't a household name. Most of you may not have heard of him, um, but he was again, working just before Impressionism sort of took off. And this, 
again, beautiful painting is the last one he painted. This artist, Mariano Fortuny, died at only 36 years old. So not only did he make this gorgeous painting at 36, um, it was his last one. He actually passed away before he finished it. And this is really something we could probably call proto-impressionism. So he's not a part of this group of, um, of imp French impressionist painters. He's just before them. So moving forward now into the late 19th and 20th century, I show you another portrait. So if you still have that wonderful portrait of the little girl in your mind, this is as though the little girl grew up. It's obviously not the same person, but the idea is this is an elite woman from a very important family. And if you look at this painting, even if I did, even if I hid the tombstone information here, which says she's a duchess, I think you could guess it. There's all these wonderful little visual clues that tell us how important she is. One of them is her dress. Look how it, how the sheen, to get that sheen, you, you've got silk. You've got really nice, expensive fabric. And I put this detail here just so you could see how the artist, Ignacio Fulaga, um, created this impression of silk. The other thing that tells us how wealthy and important she is, is this thing she's wearing on her head, which is called a mantilla. So it's a beautiful, delicate piece of handmade lace. And then the comb, which is this, this thing here, it looks kind of like a hat, would have historically, now they're made of plastic, of course, but historically they would have been made out of tortoiseshell, which is a rare and precious and rare and precious material that had to be traded internationally. This um, object she's holding in her hand is called a manton de manila. It's literally a shawl, but these were precious, expensive objects that were passed down through generations. So her having one here in, in 1918 is evidence of the fact that she's from an old enough family to have inherited this amazing object. It's silk that would have been produced in China, embroidered in the Philippines. So you want to think about empire and what empire means. It has little figures on it, and the figures' faces were actually made out of painted ivory. So another precious, precious material that all had to come together to make this one object. This painting is one of the few I'm showing you that is not part of our permanent collection. It's on loan. And this is by a contemporary of Zuluaga, the artist we just saw, Joaquin Sorolla. You may not have heard of these two artists, but during their lifetimes, they were some of the most popular artists in the United States. So it's interesting that since the early 20th century, their names have kind of gone into oblivion. But I think this is just a beautiful example of paint handling and this kind of impressionist technique and this desire to paint light and capture light. It's actually a portrait of the artist's wife and he has this wonderful little cheeky detail in here where she's looking at her ring on her finger. So even though at first it looks like a little bit racy of a, of a nude woman, you have this kind of her contemplating really the symbol of their marriage and their union. And the artist kept this for himself. He never sold it. So um, finally, we move into the world of 20th century art. And this, as, as you can see, the color on the wall has even changed. So we've signaled, we've, we've left behind purely representational art, and we're moving into the world of abstraction. And this is our one painting by the great, probably the, one of the best known Spanish artists, Pablo Picasso. He painted this at a very key moment in his career. He'd already, quote, worked with, invented cubism with Georges Braque. Um, and this is in the middle of the First World War, 1915. And he's working at this time, funnily enough, He's in a very close relationship with Diego Rivera, the great Mexican muralist painter. And I think you can see at this time in Diego Rivera's career, he was living in France and he was painting in Cubist, in the Cubist mode. So this is before he developed his telltale um, mural style, married Frida Kahlo and all of that. This is when he's still young. And he and Picasso had this wonderful relationship, but one of the things that I love about this painting, and this is just an anecdote, so this is um, a, a landscape uh, with a table and some objects. You can see this is a piece of music, this is an instrument that Picasso has broken down and kind of put back together. Um, and Diego Rivera supposedly invented 
this method of painting shrubbery, of painting bushes. So you see these kind of green patches with daubs of, of black and yellow. So shadow and light, essentially. And Picasso supposedly stole it. And Diego Rivera got so mad that the two of them never spoke again. So this is when they're still friends, but a year or two later, all bets were off. This is a, a relatively recent acquisition as well by another artist I hope you've all heard of, Salvador Dali, who is best known, of course, for this painting he has in the MoMA of the melting clocks. This painting is before the melting clocks, but I hope you notice there's already a clock. So he's already starting to work with this idea of time and how rigid time is. He painted this right after he joined the Surrealist group. And so this is an early work as he's developing this so-called surrealist language that is kind of reproducing the illogicality of dreams. He's playing with light and shadow. You can't tell if this is a diaphanous shadow or actually it's opaque, like it's an object. Um, it's very curious. This is, it's called fish man. So as you can see, there's these kind of fleshy fish that make up the, the head of the figure. It's extremely precisely painted. It's very small. You'll see the dimensions there, 10 by 7. Um, so he's working with probably some sort of magnifying glass or loop. And then there's this wonderful little pink high heel up in the corner. The pink high heel symbolized his wife, Gala. And so it's, a, and you can see there's, oops, you can see there's a little heel here as well. And he actually dedicated this painting to his muse and the love of his life. But I wanted to show you this detail as well, so you got a sense of, I think if you just saw this detail, you would never think it was Dali, right? Because it looks almost like an abstract expressionist painting or something like that. Um, but those dots are minuscule. So he mixes this kind of precision with a little bit more freedom and paint here. There's a little more paint coming off the canvas um, impasto than, than we would normally expect. Finally, we move much closer to today, and by now we are in pure abstraction. There's no goal, no um, attempt at representing anything here. And so I just have two works to show you from this section. This is by the wonderful Spanish artist Antoni Tapies, um, whose career developed around the turn of the Franco regime. So after the Spanish Civil War in the late 1930s, um, the dictator Francisco Franco had power over Spain and he was in charge of Spain until um, he, he passed away in 1975. So this painting was made just before Franco's death. And of course, after he died in 75, Spain became a constitutional monarchy or really a democracy as it were. But in this moment, we're still in, we're still in, under the, Fran the fascist regime of Franco. So, Tapies is also, but I think playing here with, is this sculpture? Is it painting? It hangs on the wall, but again, I hope you come see it in person. This area, it, it makes you wonder what's underneath. What is underneath? I don't even know, actually, I should say that. <laughs> I don't know what's underneath, but it does project out, and there's just this kind of interesting tension with these drips, and he's kind of playing with what he's revealing to you, but also what he's hiding from you. Um, so I do encourage you to come look at it. It never reproduces well. There's actually little kind of glinting glittery things in the black. And then finally, this is another painting that's on loan. It's not part of our permanent collection, but it's, I wanted to give you an example besides the Jaume Plenza and the Santiago Calatrava of a work by a living artist. This is an artist who lives and works in Madrid and um, he's lent us this wonderful painting um, as well. And he's playing with some of these sort of similar characteristics. Um, all these kind of vertical lines you see are seams. So he's actually cut the canvas apart, sewn it back together, dyed it from behind, added layers on top. So this idea of like, even though it's canvas, we're wor he's working it from both sides the way you were a sculpture. Um, again, pure in enjoyment. This is art that you can enjoy just because it makes you feel great or because you enjoy you you enjoy getting sucked in and again i encourage you to come see this in person it looks great in the gallery with natural uh, natural light and you can really appreciate the kind of nuance in the pigments so i will end by saying 
We are open to the public. If you go to our website, meadowsmuseumdallas.org, um, or just Google Meadows Museum again, um, you can purchase tickets. We're open with limited capacity. We don't have huge numbers, so it's a really great time to come and probably have the galleries to yourself. Um, we do ask you to book tickets in advance. Um, and just so it's on your radar, I showed you mostly works from the permanent collection. We are doing exhibitions. The exhibition we have coming up has been postponed, but it's of a Renaissance sculptor, uh, which is a fabulous, it, hopefully we'll be able to open it, um, so watch this space. But in the meantime, we have another related show right here, which is early 20th century photographs of works by uh, by the sculptor. So if you enjoy early photography, I definitely encourage you to come by and see the exhibition that's open. I also just want to throw out there, as I mentioned before, we have a ton of content online now. Tours, deep dives into objects, culture corner, um, poet laureate. So these are poets from SMU's student body who've written poetry in response to some of our works. All of our lectures are now on live, including I think one by one or two by me <laughs> and other scholars we've invited over time. So if you're interested in learning more about Spanish history or Spanish art, I definitely encourage you to check it out. And then again, just to give you a sense um, of a lot of the online content we're doing, Drawing with the Masters, for example, um, and various other programs um, that you can tune into without even stepping foot in the museum. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. And I am happy to entertain questions. All right, let me see if anyone has any questions in our chat for you. I, I can tell you while I'm waiting to see if anything comes through that the feedback that we've been getting in chat has been fantastic. Oh, good. They, they love <laughs> I your enthusiasm. It's a bit of a like whirlwind, like they no, just they, Spanish art in 45 minutes. <laughs> they love your enthusiasm. <laughs> they they love what you're talking about. Now, Karen Curl is after my own heart because Dolly is one of my favorite oh, artists. But good. she asks if you have any other Dolly pieces there. So we do. Um, the What I showed you is the only painting we have by mm. Dolly, but we do have a wonderful sculpture by Dolly. It's um, of the, the famous the famous ancient Greek sculpture, the Venus of Milo, yep. you know, the mm -hmm. woman with no arms. Mm -hmm. And he did a take on it where yeah. he put drawers all over her body. Yeah. Um, so we do have that on view right now. We also have a number of works on paper by Dali, so prints, um, but they only go on view for specific exhibitions because works on paper are um, very susceptible to damage from light, so we can't right. exhibit them all the time. Right. But you can definitely come see the sculpture and their painting. They, they're installed right next to each other. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. So, um, wow. So everybody's just saying thank you that they found it fantastic. Um, do you want to let everybody know in the chat, there is a message from Kaylee. They're doing five minute videos um, about the collection on their YouTube channel. Oh, great. Um, yeah, they're tiny tours. Um, and the link for those, that channel um, is in your chat box and I saved the link. We'll share it in one of our newsletters also so that way our attendees can see those. Yeah, uh, and she, I just noticed she pointed out that um, a lot of the tiny tours are also in Spanish. So if yes. there's any Spanish speakers out there, um, check Wonderful. it out. Very wonderful. I, I greatly enjoyed today. Dan, how about we uh, unmute everyone yeah, and give Amanda I was just about to say that. a big round Let's... of applause. Hang all on right, guys, you're all unmuted. Let's Yay! give it up. Yeah. Oh, thank you so, thank you so much. much. Amanda. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Everybody's still saying we have.